welcome back yeah, to Applied Mathematical Finance and Computational Finance. Uh, we are still uh, discussing interest rates, interest rate products. So we completed our section on products without optionality. Well, I sometimes call these linear products. So a financial product where say some index enters in a natural and uh, linear way. Yeah, for example, the forward rate fixed at the beginning of the period, period paid in the, at the end of the period. And uh, today I would like to move on to say nonlinear products. Well, so maybe this nonlinear refers a little bit to here the options. So we will uh, consider mainly the maximum function as this uh, nonlinearity. Um, we will look at some simple options. So what does this mean? Okay, so we have here simple. So that means first I look at uh, European options. So there's a single date where you can choose something. And then this simple also refers a little bit that um, the financial product is simple enough such that if we choose a simple model, uh, we can derive an analytic formula. So that's maybe here um, an important point. Assuming a simple model. We may derive an analytic formula. Well, valuation formula, of course. And then later we will uh, look at more complex uh, financial products that then require um, a numerical methods, or we will look at these products, but assuming a more complex uh, model for the interest rates. So that require a numerical method. So speaking of the model uh, for our products without optionality for the linear products, the special thing was that we did not need um, a stochastic model uh, to value these products. So the reason is that we could express everything in terms of some static, semi-static application strategy uh, that just uses uh, products and then we could, uh, for, for which we can uh, observe the value um, at the evaluation time. So if I use here the word valuation, I'm referring to the valuation using our universal valuation theorem, the universal pricing theorem. So that was here. So we express the value here at evaluation time, uh, for example, here in this theorem, by knowing the value at a future point in time. Okay, so that's here, for example, we are looking at European options. So maybe we have some formula for a value at a future point in time, assuming a certain model that tells us something about the probability distribution at this future point in time. Okay, so we will look at this evaluation problem in one of the next sessions. So now let's introduce the financial products. Speaking of these options on interest rates, I will first introduce uh, options on the forward rate. Yeah, and also options on the swap rate. Uh, so we have here our definition of the forward rate. 
So you know, you can express this as a ratio of zero copper bonds. But I will also make a comment that you can have all these products, for example, as options on the backward rate. And we will look at the valuation a little bit later. So another small reminder, um, we call here the swap. That is the financial product that exchanges a floating rate payment and a fixed payment at different times where the time discretization fits to the index here. So fixed uh, fits to the index. So fixed at the beginning of the period paid at the end of the period. And we also had um, the valuation of the swap. So we can express at every time little t the value of the swap using this forward rate as of little t and the zero copper bond price as of little t. Okay, so the first product I would like to look at is the caplet. Uh, so the caplet is just a call option, so an option on the forward rate. So like maybe you know it from the call option on the stock, yeah, it's the same payoff function. So we pay the maximum of the interest rate minus K and zero. Well, multiplied with a constant that is the notional here in front and the scaling with the period length is also here. So there is that, um, we have a payoff function that looks like that. So if you would like to draw the value as a function of the interest rate you observe, okay, see interest rate here is fixed in T1. Uh, we pay this amount in T2. So without um, this maximum here, this looks a little bit like a single payment of a swap, yeah, floating minus uh, fixed uh, at the end of a period. Um, so actually it's like a forward rate agreement. Uh, so the payoff that we observe here is we pay nothing. So zero if the interest rate is below K and then we pay some linear function yeah, starting in K. Um, so we pay just L minus K. Okay, so the K is called the strike rate, the strike and M is the notional in the currency that belongs to the interest rate L. So the next product is then the cap. The cap is just a portfolio of caplets, so nothing special. So we have maybe here a time discretization given T0, T1 up to Tn. And then I have this caplet in every period, yeah? So it's not the maximum on the outside of a sum of payments. It is the maximum here around every interest rate with a certain strike rate Ki. So I have here the strike rate Ki. Usually all these strikes rates are the same, yeah? So there is a certain level and all the forward rates get the same strike rate. So, but uh, to implement it in the computer or evaluation model, it's easy to just assume that you have a vector of such strike rates. So that's, that's the cap. Okay, just the portfolio of caplets. <clears throat> you can also look uh, the other way around. Uh, so, so you get the maximum of K minus L. So I'm just flipping the two inside and this guy is then called the floorlet. So the floorlet is if I pay map maximum K minus L N zero. So if you'd like to draw the payment that is made at time T I plus one. So at the end of the corresponding period as a function of L. So then you have here some strike rate K and I pay you um, K 
minus L. So whenever L is below K, I pay you something. Otherwise I pay you zero. So I pay you zero here and I pay you something here. Okay, so that's the floorlet. Okay, so maybe the two names are um, yeah, a bit uh, counterintuitive uh, because uh, you think that cap is something that is cutting off something at the top. Huh? And um, if, you, if you look at our cap, so our cap was this payoff here. as a function of the interest rate we observe, it is paying you nothing if you are below K and otherwise it's paying you this linear function. And so it's actually not, not cutting something off at the top, it's cutting something off maybe at the bottom. Uh, so um, maybe the name is a bit counterintuitive. Okay, so why, why is that? Well. Um, you can also encounter these names kept and flawed for coupons. And, and there it is what you uh, actually would intuitively think. So um, if you have an interest rate L and that interest rate is say kept, kept payoff, then this means that we take the interest rate and we cut off the payment, so the coupon um, at a level K. So actually here it is like your intuition is maybe already telling you that you have some payment of this interest rate L and then at a certain level. So here is my K, I'm cutting off the payment and I'm just paying you K, yeah? So I'm paying you the minimum of L um, and K. So L would go on, would go on here. And uh, the other way around a flawed coupon, uh, think of a, of a floating rate bond or a coupon bond, you know, a coupon bond that has this coupon. Uh, so a flawed coupon, would be that we are cutting the payment at the lower end, at the level K below. And so we would have this little picture here, L, and then the flawed one is having here a K and it's paying you the constant until L becomes larger. So it's flooring your payment at a certain level, okay. Okay, so you can have kept and floored coupons, but if you then look at the definition of a caplet, it's this financial product and the name looks a bit counterintuitive. So the caplet is the call option. Well, to, to uh, solve this, um, one explanation why we have this counterintuitive name comes from an application. So you have a certain swap that exchanges um, a floating rate payment L um, against uh, some uh, coupon. Yeah? And then if you have here, the normal floating rate payment and you exchange it against the capped floating rate payment, then you see this is the caplet, okay? So this here is just L minus um, a capped one is pay the minimum of L and K. Okay, so cut it off on the top, yeah. but that's actually the same as minus the minimum of L minus L is zero, K minus L is K minus L. Well, and minus the minimum of this is, this is take the maximum of what is inside. Yeah. So it's, 
with a minus. So this is our caplet, okay? So exchanging um, a floating rate payment against a capped uh, coupon gives you the caplet or the other way around. If you are obliged to say pay, so there's a minus here. So that means I'm obliged to pay L. Yeah, if you are obliged to pay, pay L, then you are exposed to interest rates rising. Yeah? So you have the risk that you have to pay much. Yeah? So, and to cap this risk, you buy a caplet. So buying means that I have actually here a plus and I buy a caplet. So if you buy a caplet, what you are effectively doing is you are capping your risk. You have now a capped coupon in this um, liability uh, to pay this coupon. So if you have the obligation to pay some variable interest rate, so what you do is you buy a caplet such that the coupon is then capped. Okay, so the caplet is the financial product that you buy to cap this. So maybe that's uh, an uh, explanation. Now, apart from that, for us, it's just a definition. Yeah? The caplet is the call option on the interest rate. Yeah, the next uh, nice financial product is the digital caplet. So whenever you spot the word digital, it refers to uh, a discontinuity in the payment. Yeah, so there is some indicator function in the payment. So you either receive one value or the other, depending on the con condition. Yeah. And the condition is here the same as in the caplet. So we just check is the interest rate larger or smaller than a certain given value, the strike rate. Yeah. So we have again here the strike rate K. So the payoff at, of the digital, so at payment time looks like that. So as a function of the interest rate, we have observed, so we have fixed. I just write here L, but it is L of T1, T2 observed in T1. So this is that um, we receive zero, nothing if we are below K. So maybe here's the K. Or if we are above, we receive the indicator function, so it's one here, or if this has um, a notional, then it is one times M. Okay, so we have this discontinuous payoff. Yeah, this is um, also an interesting product yeah, to, to maybe analyze um, a model. Yeah, you can um, value this product. It will tell you something about, for example, the probability distribution. If you value this proper product, take um, the expectation of this product. A nice relation is that you can approximate the value of this digital by a call option or say a portfolio of a call option. Well, you have the relation that the value of the digital option is the derivative of the value of the call option with respect to the strike, actually minus the derivative. Um, so here, speaking about interest rate, the value of the digital caplet is minus the derivative of the value of the caplet with respect to the strike. And uh, the reason that this is so, uh, you see it if you just uh, brutally move the derivative under the expectation in your valuation theorem. Yeah? So in my valuation theorem, I have that the value in zero is n of zero 
times expectation, the payoff function at the payment time uh, conditional to, to time zero. So if you just apply now this, this, this differential operator to this and swap differential operator and expectation, and you differentiate with respect to the strike. So what you, are you differentiating? You are differentiating the function that is here inside the payment. And for the caplet, that function is the maximum function. Yeah, so, uh, we have here the maximum function L minus K, okay? Well, and if you differentiate the maximum function, you get the indicator function, but then you see inside there is a minus K. So I get minus the indicator function. So if I plug here the minus in front, then I get the payment of the uh, caplet. Yeah? So you can easily see this. So maybe I already uh, did here the proof for you. Yeah? So you can easily see that there is a relation between these um, products. And since you know from numerical methods that you can approximate uh, here, a derivative by a finite difference, you can now approximate this value using here a portfolio of two caplets. So this tells you the value of the digital option. Well, approximately um, is given by taking a portfolio of two caplets at two different strikes. Uh, so the strikes are now K plus epsilon and K minus epsilon. And in addition, we have here divided by two epsilon. So this means that we have a portfolio of the two products long and short, so plus and minus. So buy one caplet, sell one caplet with a big notional. So a large notional. So the notional is one divided by two epsilon. So if you would like to make this approximation accurate, the portfolio comes with two options that have a small difference in strike, but have a large notional. That's a problem. That's also a risky strategy. Yeah? So if you have two la very large positions, for example, if a counterpart defaults yeah, and doesn't pay, pay back, that, that there, there, there is a risk. Yeah? So actually, if you do this strategy, you, this strategy is done in practice by a trader. Yeah. Um, but you have to be a little bit careful about this, this problem with the very big notional, especially if this option is very close to maturity, which means that uh, the jump in the value or the smoothness um, of this uh, uh, caplet value is uh, then um, yeah, small, which, which will then create a high sensitivity to, to changes in, in the parameters. Uh, yeah, okay, that's an interesting product. Maybe we can study this uh, a little bit. So here is a small picture. Yeah, so what we are doing. So you see that you have here two uh, caplets. So I have here the caplet with strike K minus epsilon. So this guy is maximum of L, you're underlying minus K minus epsilon and zero. So this here is K minus epsilon. And the other guy, of course, is the other call option, maximum L minus K plus epsilon and zero, and you see that you have approximated the digital. Yeah, so first your blue financial product pays nothing, then your blue financial product pays something, but then you have a short position, so you have to give the payment 
to the holder of the other option. Yeah, and uh, we just keep the difference. Okay, so um, this is the digital caplet. So now to a very important financial product, the swaption. Okay, so the swaption is just an option on a swap. And when we define the swaption, we take a different approach compared to what we did before. Before, actually, I, I described what is the payoff of the financial product. So you see, as before for the linear products, we say here, this product pays something at a certain time. And we have a function of our market observed indices or quantities. So now with the swaption, which is an option on the swap, the definition looks a little bit different. What I'm doing here, swaption, swaption is an option on the swap. And now I assume that I have the value process of that swap. So there is a certain definition of that swap. So the swap has these payments in the future. And I assume that V subscript swap denotes the value process of the swap. So V of T is the time T value of that swap. And then I'm defining that the value of the swaption is given by taking the value of the swap if the value of the swap is positive, otherwise zero. So I have here just the value of this swap inside this formula. So you have the option to receive the swap. And of course, you just take the swap if it has a positive value for you. And there is here just the value of the swap inside this formula. So we perform evaluation of this financial product and uh, the payments of this swap is maybe defined in some appendix describing uh, the, the swap. So this raises a small question. So how is this done in practice? So actually you can have two different ways. You can have the so-called physical settlement or the so-called cash settlement. So for the physical settlement, it is that upon this exercise date, so here the exercise date is the date T1, I choose if I take the option or not, upon the exercise date, I really receive the financial product. I receive the swap. So I have another new financial product in my portfolio. So that's the physical settlement. So um, if I'm delivering the underlying financial product, this is called physical settlement. Alternatively, I can just pay you the value in cash. So if I just pay you the value in cash, this is called cash settlement. Well, from a financial valuation point of view, so from a fund, uh, from an valuation point of view, it actually doesn't make a difference yeah, because you make this optimal decision based on the value. Yeah, and if the cash is just the value, then you base it on the same amount. Um, so idealize this settlement type uh, wouldn't make a difference to the evaluation. It makes a difference in processing. No? So there are also maybe slight other um, differences because owning the swap, you are then connected still to a counterparty that can default. No? So um, some, some other stuff may, may go on yeah, while in the cash settlement, actually the product is terminated. Um, however, apart from this, uh, it may be that in a contract, the cash settlement is specified by a formula or, or some algorithm. So we may have here in a cash settlement a formula or some algorithm which determines this amount. 
because there's the question, how do you value this swap? Huh? So which zero Cooper bonds do you use to calculate the values? Um, are these different? Okay, and sometimes even an, an approximate valuation is used. Yeah? And this may introduce some complicated uh, differences. So it's not completely clear how this value is calculated in, um, in the cash settlement. Well, it is clear because it is specified in the contract, but it may differ from your, um, say, perceived uh, way what would be uh, the valuation. So sometimes you have so-called uh, calculation agents that provide such values. Sometimes it's just linked to an index, a swap rate, for example, uh, which is specified in some contract. Uh, so this uh, settlement type can make a difference to the evaluations. And yeah, so that was um, a question in our uh, coffee break session we had. So uh, this, this is, for example, a subtle difference yeah, where uh, a bank is maybe investing a lot of um, work to get this, uh, this different right. Now, also because swaps come with very large notionals, yeah, uh, millions, and it's a very big market and small differences can make a, a really can make a difference. Okay, so going back to this definition, we define here the financial product um, for us as a function of a future value of some underlying product. For us, that's maybe okay because we are just interested in the valuation of these financial products. Um, the swap chain is also an important financial product because it is related to an option on a bond, on a coupon bond. So let me explain that. So the swap chain is related to an option on a coupon bond. So let's look here to the coupon bond. First, recall what is the coupon bond. I'm looking here at the fixed coupon bond. So we have a certain timeline here with a time discretization, our tenor discretizations, say TN and here's T1. T2, and I have fixed constant payments. These coupons, CI, well, scaled with the period length, that's just the constant. In addition, I receive at the end the notional. So there's also here a one unit which I receive. So that's here the payment of my coupon bond. I have the coupons, whoops. I have here the coupons and I have the notional payment at the end of the lifetime of the, of the product. And now um, I have an option to receive this bond at time T1. Well, uh, if um, these are guaranteed payments, the value of these payments is always positive. Yeah? So if you just have the option to receive these payments, you would immediately exercise the option because you would like to receive payments. So the option is that you are allowed to receive these payments if you pay here one unit of currency. So you have to pay here a uh, one, so paying one is minus one. So I draw an arrow down if I pay this. Um, so the option value is then that you are allowed to receive this object here at pawn time T1. So that's the time when I decide if I would like to receive this. So that's my exercise date. Maybe I mark that in a different color. Okay, so that's the exercise date. So I will look at the value of this thing at time T1. So this thing I call now the forward bond, yeah, the value of the forward coupon bond. And the value of my forward coupon bond is just 
you receive the coupon bond. So the coupon bond was here, my queen guy, but you have to pay one unit of notional at the beginning of the period. So there's here the minus because we have to pay. And the plus because we receive the bond. So I have an option on the bond and um, I'm currently at some time say little t so assume that we are here okay and we like to value this financial product huh? so the option so on this um, bond on the forward bond uh, so you see this is similar to what we did um, in uh, for the swaption i know the value of this financial product at a certain time in TI, when I exercise this financial product, I do know the value. The value is the value of a coupon bond minus one. Okay, so we can value a coupon bond. We can value also the minus one. That's it's just minus a zero coupon bond. So the value of this forward bond, so this is now our valuation. Yeah, so that's not different from what we did. So value of the forward bond is the value of the coupon bond. So that's all coupons just multiplied with um, a zero coupon bond plus the final notional, which is just a zero coupon bond. And then I have to value my upfront payment of one unit, my notional payment. So that's minus uh, the zero coupon bond price. So trivial, the value of this forward coupon bond is this um, expression. And um, yeah, there is a nice thing. You see that there is a difference here, a bond at the end minus the bond at the beginning. So that maybe triggers something. That is the value of floating rate payments. So this just corresponds to paying in each period Li. Yeah. So since it is the bond at the end minus the bond at the beginning, this is flipped. So it is minus Li. And you see that the coupon bond is just a swap so the option on the, so the forward coupon bond is just a swap. So the option um, on this guy is just a swap option. Okay, so maybe a nice relation, yeah? So you see um, that this construct here that you can receive a bond for a pre-accrued notional payment is just uh, the option on the swap, um, swap option. Okay, so uh, let's uh, complete uh, the session here on introducing some um, optional products by uh, two more exotic guys. Yeah? So the foreign caplet and the quanto. The foreign caplet is just a caplet in foreign currency. And that's maybe not something special. So the foreign caplet is just a caplet in foreign currency. So I just define now every, every object as an object of the foreign market. So there is some foreign interest rate. So let's call this L tilde. So I now mark everything with a tilde that comes from the foreign market. So if your foreign market is, for example, US dollar, that would be the US dollar uh, um, interest rate. So if I'm an investor sitting in a euro market, that would be the US dollar interest rate or the other way around. If you are an US dollar investor, that could be the euro interest rate. And then this interest rate is multiplied with some notional and this notional is also given in the foreign currency. So I have here some M tilde and this denotes the notional in the foreign currency. Okay, so if you are now holding this 
financial product as a domestic investor, where what you are getting paid is not the foreign currency, you are getting paid your domestic currency. So what is happening is that at payment time, so this here is the payment time, I'm looking at what is the conversion rate from foreign currency to domestic currency. And I multiply the foreign amount with this conversion rate. So I have here the FX rate. So FX here is for foreign exchange. So FX of T2 is the exchange rate for the currency. So what is the unit of this FX? So it is a factor I'm applying to one foreign currency unit to get one domestic currency unit. So that's one domestic divided by one foreign. So what is the value of a foreign currency unit in your domestic currency units? So that guy is translating the foreign payment to your domestic values. Okay, so that is the thing um, from a domestic investor's point of view. Okay, so that looks now over complicated because it's just a very simple thing. You have all the financial product in the foreign market. So that here is just a caplet. And whenever you like to transform a value in your domestic currency, you multiply with this factor. Yeah. So what's what's the big thing here? Okay, so there, there is nothing special. Huh? And actually, there are also now two different ways to value this. You can value it in the foreign market and then transform the value to your market. You can also transform all the, the payments to your market and value in your market. And uh, the two results should be the same. Otherwise, we have an arbitrage. So that will become an interesting thing when we look at this. But apart from this, this is just uh, a plain caplet. Yeah? So this is the foreign caplet. We multiply here the interest rate payment with the foreign currency notional and convert the payment upon payment time. So that's here important. Yeah? The FX rate is taken from payment time because the FX rate converts Words the payment yeah? um, and the interest rate here is fixed, of course, at fixing time. So if these are two stochastic processes, so if we have here two stochastic processes, the interest rate and the conversion rate, I'm actually fixing these at two different times. So that's the uh, foreign caplet. And now there is an interesting thing, the so-called quanto or quanto caplet, well, the quanto is just the same. So I have a foreign currency interest rate. Here, if I have a caplet, it is taking maximum of interest rate minus K so that I have an option. And then I multiply this, actually in this case, the floored payment. Yeah? So I multiply the maximum L minus K and zero. I multiply it with my foreign currency amount, but then the quanto uses as conversion rate, just unit one. So that's a strange thing. So I look at, uh, I, I take a US dollar amount, 100 US dollar. I take the US dollar interest rate, maybe 10%. So at the end, I have 110. So the payment is maybe 10 US dollar. And then I convert this to euro and pay you 10 euro. That looks uh, strange, unnatural. Um, Sometimes such uh, quantos are um, yeah, interesting if you like to participate in the changes of a certain object on the foreign market, could also be on the stock. Yeah, you would like to uh, participate at uh, Tesla stock or Apple stock, but you do not like to have the risk 
of currency conversion. Yeah? So whenever it's performing good in the foreign currency, you would like to have exactly this performance in your currency. Because here it may happen for the caplet that you gain something because this object is going in favor of you, but then you lose something because the exchange rate is going against you. And the reason is that you can maybe decouple this by looking at the so-called Quanto that just uses a fixed, um, that may also be a predefined conversion rate, yeah, 1.3 or something, because that would just go into this constant. Huh? It uses a fixed predefined conversion rate while the caplet or the non-quanto uses a stochastic observed at payment time conversion rate. From a mathematical point of view, the quanto is quite interesting. Yeah, we, we can derive an analytic formula for the quanto. Although that's 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 an interesting uh, product. Yeah. So here for the quanto or quanto caplet. So we use just instead of the foreign currency conversion rate fx, we just use a constant. Okay, so um, a remark here in is in order to conclude this. Uh, this is a nice point here to remind you again that it is useful to consider units because now we have multiple currencies with the foreign currency caplet or the quanto caplet. It is um, nice to consider the units. So for example, if we are in domestic currency, our domestic zero copper bond, it has the unit domestic currency. If we look at the foreign currency bond, it has the unit foreign currency. The interest rates, they have unit one divided by time. Yeah, so here our interest rate multiplied with the period length is unit less. The forward rate has unit one divided by time. And our currency exchange rate, as I already mentioned on the previous slides, has unit one domestic currency per one foreign currency. And sometimes nice to check uh, the units. And here, of course, our foreign currency notion uh, is in foreign currency. Okay, so a last remark. Um, you can have all these guys also on the backward rate. So I just used uh, here the forward rate in, or in um, all the definitions. So here, for example, the caplet, it was an option on the forward rate. So here was the L. Yeah? So that's just the underlying index for which we define this option. But you can have all these um, financial products also on the backward rate. So um, just replace in the definition the index that I had there, for example, here my L, by the corresponding backward rate, uh, the I, in this respective definition. For the swaption, it's just uh, an option on a swap that refers to the backward looking rate. Yeah? So a swap of the backward looking rate. Um, small warning, yeah? if you take a different index, it may alter the value. Well, we, we, we saw situations where it does not alter the value. Yeah? The value of a swap on the backward rate is actually the same as the value of swap on the corresponding forward rate. But um, if you... Um, look, for example, for the caplet, it will make um, a different if you switch to the other index. And we can have a look at this once we introduce the uh, models that we need for the valuation. So that was it for this session where we introduced some financial products. And the next session will then look at models that we may use to value these products. And these models are simple models that allow for an analytic formula.